Thanks to YouTube shutting down its rewind for good, there are no fun memes or spoofs to use to introduce the much better Paleo Rewind this year. So without further ado, I'm Destin of Edge and welcome to Paleo Rewind 2021. Every year, hundreds of amazing discoveries are made. Since my main interest involves the lives of long dead animals, I bring together a group of other creators to talk about the most interesting and important of them. This is Paleo Rewind. This year I've done something a lot more ambitious than last year. Doubled the number of participants. Instead of 12 people covering a month each, there are 24 people. Each month has two creators making a video. Each of their sections will release in the 12 days leading up to the 1st of January. On that day, I will release a compilation of everyone's segments here on the Edge channel. This year, those involved include The Curious Archive for the first half of January and Paleo Analysis for the second to be released on the 20th. Myself and Dylan of Paleo Archive for February on the 21st. Henry the Paleo Guy and Omega Studios for March on the 22nd. The Dinosaurs Will Always Be Awesome podcast and Steven from Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong for April on the 23rd. Spino Dude Reviews and me again for May on the 24th. Adasaur and Keenan Taylor for June on the 25th. Raptor Chatter and the Through Time and Clades podcast for July on the 26th. Dr. Polaris and Past Eons Productions for August on the 27th. Prehistorica and Spencer of Cretaceous Cast for September on the 28th. Ben from Benji Thomas and Dino Diego for October on the 29th. Dane Pavitt and the Budget Museum for November on the 30th. And finally, North 2 and Biotiverse for December on the 31st. Hey everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, and this year I was fortunate enough to be invited to the Paleo Rewind for 2021 with the Channel Edge, who organizes a lot of Paleo YouTubers into essentially splitting the year up into more digestible pieces rather than one massive year in review. And with that in mind, I actually chose to pick the first part of July as my main focus for what I'm going to discuss. And that's because there were some papers that I found really interesting, and if you follow the channel, the last one will be very on brand for me. And with all that said, let's get started. So the story of this first paper starts with a particle accelerator. And if you're not familiar with what a particle accelerator is, it's a giant tube many kilometers across in which particles are accelerated. And what this does is it releases a lot of different types of radiation and light rays off of these particles including some very, very fine-scale x-rays that can be used to image fossils. And honestly, this technology has been around for a while, and only now are fossils actually being imaged using it. Now the costs to use it have gone down, and that means researchers were able to put a fossil of Heterodontosaurus tuckeye into this machine. And they were actually able to image some very fine-scale ribs that weren't visible when they originally looked at the fossil. Heterodontosaurus was an Ornithischian dinosaur, meaning it was related to things like Parasaurolophus and Triceratops, although not directly related. So it's very much its own thing, although still lets us know what some of the early Ornithischians may have been like. And these new ribs, which are actually gastralia, meaning belly ribs, may have actually helped us to understand how these animals would have breathed. And this seems a little bit strange to talk about how different animals breathe, but different animals do have different methods of it. For example, frogs use a buccal pump, which means they essentially pump air into their mouth and then into their lungs and then back out into their mouth and then back out their nose. And you can actually see this when some frogs are just sitting neutrally. Birds have air sacs, which they then expand and then pump that into the lungs and then refill the air sacs and then empty the lungs and then refill the lungs with that air sac. So they almost always have air inside their lungs. But these heterodontosaurus fossils show that there were some different muscle attachments on these gastralia, and that actually puts them very closely in common with us. Now, that's not in evolutionary terms. They are still very much dinosaurs, and we are still very much not dinosaurs. But these gastralia show that there would have been muscles running up and down these belly ribs of Heterodontosaurus. Meanwhile, in humans, we have muscles running up and down our ribs, which when we take a deep breath, we can expand the chest cavity and then let that chest cavity depress. And this is probably what Heterodontosaurus was doing. 
It was essentially using muscles on these belly ribs to physically expand the chest. And part of this is shown by the somewhat strange shape of many of these belly ribs, because this would have allowed them to stretch and pivot a little bit in relative position to one another. And that would have expanded the chest cavity so that these animals could breathe. So it's not identical to the system that humans have, but it is pretty similar, which is actually interesting because the later Ornithischians took an entirely different approach to breathing, at least as far as we can tell. In fact, some of the differences, at least physically, can be pretty obvious, because Heterodontosaurus had these gastrilli going all the way down to the pelvis, so where the hips are. Meanwhile, it seems like later Ornithischians lost these entirely and that these gastrilli were not used in breathing in any way. Instead, it's much more likely that a muscle attached to part of the pelvis and then to the back of the lungs, and then contracting that muscle would expand the lungs and let air in, and then relaxing it would deflate so the animal could breathe out. So this paper is really cool because you're using subatomic particles generated by a massive particle accelerator to x-ray a fossil and understand how dinosaurs would have breathed, but also how their breathing evolved through time. Now our next paper isn't about fossils at all, or at least it isn't directly about fossils. And that's because it's a climate study on the J-hole biota. And the J-hole biota is from the Yixian and Jiufutang formations of China. And it contains many, many feathered dinosaurs, but also mammals preserved with fur. And some of these dinosaurs include things like Microraptor and Cetacosaurus, but also the large fluffy Tyrannosaur, Eutyrannus which was preserved with three different specimens, all of which had at least some kind of downy feather on them. In general though, large animals don't have as much hair, and we can see this in places like Africa where you have things like the large rhinoceros and elephants which really don't have fur, and so the same logic applies to dinosaurs having feathers for warmth. Although we also have woolly rhinos and woolly mammoths which are related and we're living in colder environments. So was the J-hole biota colder? The answer from this paper seems to be yes. Now it's important to understand the J-hole biota comes from the early Cretaceous, when the planet was generally warmer. And so what researchers did is they looked at carbonate rocks, and carbonate just means it's some sort of ion attached to the polyatomic ion of carbonate, so CO3 with a negative two charge. And there's a lot of things that can attach to this. One of the most famous is calcium, which makes calcite, which is essentially limestone. But because of the oxygens present in this polyatomic ion of carbonate, you can actually get some good data for what the environment would have been like, because oxygen comes in two different kinds of isotopes. So essentially at different temperatures, you'll have different concentrations of these two isotopes in proportion to one another. And by looking at the proportions present in the J-hole biota's carbonates, they were actually able to see that it was pretty cold there. And so that means that the J-hole biota probably lived at very high altitude. And these are pretty significant altitudes. Based on the generally warmer temperatures in the rest of the world, but the cold temperatures here, the authors estimate that these animals were living between 2,800 meters in altitude and 4,100 meters in altitude. So that's about 9,100 feet high to about 13,000 feet high. So these animals may have been living in very, very high conditions. It essentially, they could have been in almost tundra-like conditions due to the elevation that was present in this environment. This then leads into the temperature estimates that these authors propose, with an average temperature of about 6 degrees Celsius, or about 43 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's year-round, so the yearly temperature, including the summer, is still only 43 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty chilly where these animals were living. And that actually may have been the reason that they evolved feathers in the first place. Essentially, it helps to support the idea that feathers may have evolved simply for warmth, and now moving into the Permian, we're going to be looking at Solurosaurus, which if you're familiar with the show Primeval by the British Broadcasting Channel, you may actually know that they had a pet one in that show. And there's some differences, most notably the crest. And that's because these authors looked at the skull of Solurosaurus in more detail and found that the crest that it did have in the show wouldn't have been shaped quite like that. Instead, it would have been much more like a Triceratopsian skull, where it would have been more flat and along the back, rather than a single ridge down the middle. This study actually tells us a lot about the larger group that Solurosaurus actually belongs to, the Wegeltosaurids, all of which seem to have been gliders. At least Wegeltosaurus was and Solurosaurus was, as well as others that show evidence of this. So it's very likely they were gliding, and this is our first good look at the skull of one of these animals. And it shows some odd features. For example, it may not have had vomer bones at all. 
and vomer bones are just one of the bones of the skull of many different animals. Another set of bones inside the skull of many animals is the pterygoids, and these were actually separated by a gap in Solurosaurus. These two features together gave it a wide gap in its mouth, in which it could probably fit larger prey, and I say prey specifically because the dentition and the large muscle connections that are caused by this gap in the mouth probably helped it to chew on very hard things, such as insect carapaces. Now, there's a chance it could have chewed on seeds or something, but based on what we know of its environment, it's far more likely that it was actually eating a lot of insects. Because exoskeletons can be really hard, and Solorosaurus was the kind of reptile that seems like it would have eaten those things. And when I mention those large muscles, there were fossa, so essentially holes in the back of the skull where the muscles passed through that were incredibly large, at least relative to an animal its size. So it would have definitely had a very strong bite. So it could have been comparable to something like potentially a Tokei gecko today, which also has large jaw muscles and can definitely give you a pretty nasty bite if it does get a hold of you. Additionally, with the crest, they also suggest that it may have been used in some sort of display, but also it might have some defensive features because it may have been used somewhat like modern horned lizards do today. And essentially horned lizards have a lot of spikes along the back of their head that when they're provoked, they will tuck their head down and have those spikes point up in order to protect themselves. So potentially Solorosaurus was doing this. So this paper may actually help us to understand what the Wegeltosaurids were actually doing, which is gliding from tree to tree, munching on insects, and protecting themselves from larger predators. Of course, looking at a lot of other Wiggletosaurids is going to be helpful for this, and these authors already mentioned that they are doing that. So hopefully in the next year, we'll get a lot more information on the Wiggletosaurids. As for animals that are entirely newly named this year, in the video for early June by Atasaur, there was a mention of the animal Phylax, which is known from a left dentary coming from Spain. And now there's another dinosaur known from a right dentary coming from Spain that's also closely related as a hadrosauroid not a hadrosaur, it's just closely related to the hadrosaurs. I'll get into that here in a moment. Portesaurus sospenati is the new one that was named in early July, and it actually plots very consistently with Aranosaurus, which comes from Africa, and Bolong, which comes from China. And this is really interesting because it plots with them incredibly, incredibly consistently. As in, in every single analysis that these authors did, it plots with those two other animals. This is really, really strange, because while many authors run many, many analyses when they're doing these kinds of tests for where an animal's most likely to be related, it almost never shows up that they plot in just one place consistently 100% of the time. So it seems very distinctive that this was its own clade. In fact, it's so consistent that the authors do mention that Portosaurus may actually just be a fragmentary specimen of something like Aranosaurus or Bolong, but all these taxa are separated by millions of years, so it's not that likely. Hopefully we'll get some more fossils coming from Spain though, especially of these hadrosauroids that aren't quite hadrosaurs yet, so we can try and understand more about their evolution. And also so we can have something to talk about more than just jawbones. Another new animal is described though, coming from closer to where I live, near the petrified forest in Arizona. And this animal wasn't in the petrified forest, it was nearby, near the Placerius quarry, where dozens of Placerius specimens have been found. Placerius being a large synapsid, which means it's closer related to mammals than reptiles, which was one of the dominant herbivores during this time period. However, this animal is also an herbivore, and since it's the first time we found it, doesn't seem to have been as dominant. But some of its other features make it very, very interesting. Symptomi prosopis sucororum is a new species of archosauriform. And I say archosauriform because it hasn't been distinctly placed in a single group but it seems like it was much more closely related to crocodiliforms than it was to dinosaurs, with both of those being included within archosauriforms. Now, all that said, it was still very different from any other archosauriform that we know of during this time period, because it had a very short face. And that doesn't seem that interesting, but I mean very, very short. This actually made it convergent with some later crocodilians during the Cretaceous, so many, many millions of years later, such as Simosuchus, which is believed to have been herbivorous. In fact, it also had some altering teeth, which while Simosuchus didn't have different kinds of teeth, some other crocodilians did evolve different kinds of teeth, and many of those are believed to have been herbivorous or at least omnivorous. So it's very likely that Syntomi prosopis was doing something similar, either being omnivorous or even entirely herbivorous. And there were a few crocodiliforms 
during this time period which were herbivorous, for example, the Aedesuchians, although Sintomi prosopis doesn't seem to have quite those same adaptations to be one of those. And I say that because Sintomi prosopis has kind of a hodgepodge of different features that make it really hard to place. Some features are more crocodile-like, and some are more non-crocodile-like. For example, there's not a depression in the basio-occipital bone, which makes it less croc-like. However, it also has a small crest made by the fused parietal bones, which makes it more croc-like. What this really means is we need to find more of this animal, because it could have a lot of very important implications for the evolution and diversification of the crocodiliforms, at least early on. And hopefully we will find more of this, because again, this is a quarry that's been well studied. So also finding something as totally unique as this animal is pretty unexpected and really goes to show how if you're looking even in places where fossils have already been found and well documented, you still might come up with something new. And moving much closer to the present day, if I say proboscideans, you may think of elephants, such as the Asian or African elephants. And you might even think of things like mammoths but you will not think of animals like this. And that's because, unlike in the fossil record, we do not have a lot of diversity in the proboscideans, which is essentially elephants and their relatives. Instead, we have the Asian elephant, and we have the African elephants. So really, not a very diverse group there. Meanwhile, if you look in the fossil record, you have things like the dinotheres, but also gomphotheres, and even the stegomastodons. This paper sought to look at the broad history of this entire group and try and put their diversification and extinctions into context so that they can hopefully be compared to other groups in the future. And they found quite a few different things. For example, the proboscideans migrated to North America during the Miocene across the Bering Land Bridge. And once they were there, they actually evolved quite a bit, diversifying into the gomphotheres, but also the amabilodontids. Of course, neither of these two groups actually made it into the modern day, and many other groups also didn't make it into the modern day, so it's not limiting it to just those ones. And there were many different events that actually caused this. The first seems to be during the late Miocene and into the Pliocene when the Ice Ages started, and this would have cut back on a lot of the different environments that these animals would have been living in, and then caused their extinction from that environmental collapse. Although some did live into the Ice Ages, the next event came about 3 million years ago, and it's not entirely sure what caused it, but there was a major loss in diversity. This actually didn't affect Africa until about 2.4 million years ago, and Africa is where the proboscideans got their start, so it does make sense that they'd be most adapted for those conditions. So whatever changed globally didn't affect Africa until later. And then there was still some moderate diversity, including things like the mammoths. Of course, hunting by humans and the end of the Ice Ages pretty much led to the extinction of most of the rest of those groups, leaving us with the very limited diversity that we have today, which is really odd considering just how diverse they used to be. I mean, there were all these different, slightly different forms, but today we have very little, which is really unfortunate from an evolutionary and biodiversity perspective. It would have been really nice if some of those did survive to the modern day. One of the reasons it would have been good to have these animals survive until the modern day is so that we could actually see what they ate, and it's kind of hard to tell what animals ate in the fossil record. I mean, unless you have direct evidence like the animal that it ate inside its rib cage, it's pretty hard to tell other than judging by the shape of teeth. And some animals don't really have teeth, for example, the birds. And while some people might say it's not important to know exactly what an animal ate, in the case of the birds, it is for understanding their evolution, because the evolution of flight in the birds may be connected to their diet. And so these authors sought to set out essentially a guideline for different bird species, or at least fossil bird species, to be tested to understand what they most likely ate. And they tested many, many different metrics to try and understand what these animals ate. The first set of metrics has all to do with direct evidence. So for example, if you find a fossil of an animal and it has something like a lizard in its stomach, you know it ate lizards. Really, really good metric very unambiguous. However, then you can also look at things like microware on the teeth if that early bird did have teeth, and some of them did, some of them didn't. Essentially, when an animal eats something, whatever it's eating will scratch the teeth in different ways, and by studying those scratches, you can actually understand what it was eating. So that's the second direct evidence method. The final direct evidence method is by essentially looking at either coprolites, so fossilized poop, or regurgitates, so fossilized vomit. And if you see things like the bones of a lizard inside the coprolite, it 
probably ate that lizard. It's a, again, a very unambiguous metric. And while I said the other one was the final hard evidence metric, there is another, but it's somewhat rare because it has to do with soft tissue preservation. So essentially the preservation of the animal's beak. And as you can see in this toucan's beak with the skull, both without the beak on and with the beak on, the beak can entirely change the shape of the animal's mouth. So if that is preserved, you can actually get some direct evidence. If that's not preserved, it's really hard to get that evidence. So that one only exists in rare cases. So we're gonna move on now to the more implied lines of evidence, where there's good reason to believe that it probably would have eaten a specific subject, but it's really hard to tell because there's not that direct evidence. And so there's many different features that can try and lead into this. For example, body size. Essentially, sparrows eat very small things, such as insects or even seeds. Whereas larger birds, such as the raptors, like a golden eagle, for example, eats more vertebrate material. It is a much more aggressive feeder that's going to feed on other animals. You can also do chemical analyses on the dentine of teeth of animals, if they do have teeth, which many birds don't again, and that can help you understand what they were eating based on how dense those teeth are. Additionally, you can look at other morphometrics of these animals. For example, what was the beak shape? Because even some raptors do start to show some of that pointed beak, but also they have large talons, which is a really good indicator that they probably catch large prey. So that's another one of those morphometrics you can apply to try and understand what an animal was eating. And there's some subcategories of these that they break down into greater detail, but they don't just leave it there because they actually do test it on a golden eagle. And by putting the golden eagle into this matrix, they were able to go, yeah, this works for at least this animal. And I imagine it'll be tested on more modern birds even today. With the golden eagle test, you can actually see where they had to remove all of the teeth stuff because it doesn't work because golden eagles don't have any teeth. But the talons were seen as morphometrically significant. And the mechanics of the jaws, so another morphometric measurement, shows adaptations for predation because it could bite hard enough to actually try and prey on something else. The mass also means it's large enough to capture prey that's large enough to sustain the animal. All that together means that this is a very good framework to start applying to other fossils so we can try and understand what the diets of the first birds actually were, as opposed to just kind of guessing based on a few isolated ideas, we actually have a concrete methodology to try and apply this in the future. And that's a very important part of paleontology is essentially setting up these frameworks to test ideas in the future. And finally, one of the papers that I think might actually be one of the more important ones that's kind of underrepresented is about paleontoethics. And that's a new term that is brought up, but it essentially deals with the ethics of paleontology. And that's a very important thing because there's been a lot of debate about this recently within the field. Now, a lot of this has to do with things like the Burmese amber, where there's really, really incredible fossils coming from it. But also it's basically dug out of slave labor and also widespread human rights violations by the Myanmar government. So it's really not a great thing to study because you're implicitly supporting those ideologies. That said, there's still more growing concerns that we should have. For example, in human evolution, there is a growing conflict in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, which is right next to the Afar region where many early hominin fossils come from. So there's more happening there as well as the repatriation. So essentially sending back fossils that are from other countries that are housed elsewhere. For example, Ubi Rajara was smuggled out of Brazil during the 90s, and the laws in Brazil specifically state, hey, don't do this. So it was smuggled, not just taken out. So these are just some examples of why we need to actually start repairing these fossil-based injustices so that the people from these countries can actually start becoming more involved in the research that is occurring on fossils from those countries. A good example of these kind of ethics being applied, not in paleontology, but in geology, actually comes from Bolivia where the indigenous people of Bolivia were given control of lithium mines in that country. And this then meant that they were able to raise themselves out of poverty on a much broader scale than previously. So by applying this same kind of logic to paleontology, by correcting some of these injustices against marginalized groups, we can actually have a more cohesive unit within the paleontology community for research, where different researchers can actually come from anywhere rather than being isolated to just a few wealthy countries, we can actually have a broader system that supports all paleontologists and all people who are interested in the natural sciences.
In fact, the authors go on to define the entire term of paleontoethics, stating that it is the branch of geoethics that consists of research and reflection on the values that underpin a correct behavior and practice while collecting, handling, researching, and exhibiting fossils. Paleontoethics promotes the analysis of ethical problems and dilemmas that arise in different geological, economical, and cultural contexts, which affect the management, conservation, and popularization of fossils. Which is to say that, like the last paper set up a framework for studying bird diets, this paper is trying to set up the framework with which to discuss some of these ethical issues. And they go into certain things, such as the cultural implications of some of these geologic formations. For some simple examples of the cultural importance of rocks and different geologic features, you need to understand that the Swiss would not be the Swiss without the Alps. But also, the tribes of the Colorado Plateau, such as the Navajo, would not be the Navajo without the Colorado Plateau rocks. So the Colorado Plateau is a large geologic feature that was uplifted and contains many, many fossil-bearing units. So understanding how these tribes and different peoples actually interacted with the rocks that are around them is very important for understanding how we can actually go forward in the future to help promote geologic awareness and help promote the idea that paleontologists really can come from anywhere. It's not limited to just white guys like me. So first up is actually the only story we picked describing a new dinosaur or a new species of any sort, in fact. Um, I talked about this find in more detail in the 2021 update special for our series, uh, Dinosaurs, the Second Chapter. But in brief, it is a new genus and species of fossil bird from the Eocene of England called Archaeodromus anglicus. Archaeodromus was a member of a group of extinct birds called Archaeotrogonids, and when they were first described in the 19th century, Archaeotrogonids were considered to be closely related to a group of modern tropical birds called the Trogons, hence their name. However, more complete specimens later showed that they're more likely members of a completely different group, Strysores, which includes nightjars, potus, frogmouths, swifts, hummingbirds, and some of their other close relatives. This is one of my favorite groups of birds, and their evolution is one of the main subjects of my PhD thesis. So uh, if you'd like to hear more about their diversity and evolution, you should check out uh, episode 5 of Dinosaurs, the second chapter, which is available on our channel. Something strange about the fossil record of Strysores is that until recently, we didn't have good fossil evidence of early members of the nightjar lineage. We had pretty good paleogene fossils of early potus, early frogmouths, early swifts, and even early hummingbirds, but not nightjars, which is very odd because modern nightjars, of which I have a modern species pictured here, they're quite diverse with nearly 100 species and they're found all over the world. But this new bird, Archaeodromus, which is known from a uh, partial skeleton, including some vertebrae, uh, wing bones, and parts of the skull, uh, it exhibits features that not only support the idea that Archaeotrogonids are members of Strysores, but also that Archaeotrogonids might belong specifically to the nightjar lineage. And if this is correct, then it turns out that the real stem nightjars were with us all along, and so the Archaeotrogonids can help us fill in this noticeable gap in the avian fossil record. And interestingly, some Archaeotrogonids, including apparently undescribed specimens of Archaeodromus, had these bony spikes on their wrists that they might have used for fighting each other, which is not something we see in living members of Strysores. Excellent. So next up, we have a paper regarding the radiodonts, which were one of the largest groups of stem arthropods that first gained a foothold in the seas of the Cambrian period. If you know genera like Nomalocaris, or the recently described Agirocassus, those were members of this clade. A notable feature of these animals were their frontal appendages, these large segmented structures that were tipped with rows of spines, which were hypothesized to have been like grasping arms, allowing a radiodont to grab a passing trilobite or jellyfish and transfer them to their crushing mouth parts, as illustrated to the right. While this has been a popular image for some time, there has never really been any good understanding of just how these frontal appendages moved and worked. That's where this paper came in. The author's making digital models of the arms of five different radiodont species from the Burgess Shale site to reconstruct their ranges of motion. As was hypothesized from previous studies, there was found to be a significant diversity in the ways that different radiodont species use their frontal appendages. 
Some examples include Anomalocaris, which was found to have quite flexible arms for hunting mostly soft-bodied prey animals, like the potentially deuterostone Betulacolians. Uh, the squatter-bodied Petoya was found to have a more jaw-like appendages for nipping and handling larger and more hard-bodied animals. And then there's Cambrobraster, which was originally hypothesized to have been a sediment sifter, but was actually found to have perhaps been a filter-feeding radiodont, as the long spines on their appendages were more suited to that task. Now, one curious aspect of this study was that, in all cases, radiodonts were found to have been quite inefficient feeders compared to true arthropods. Despite the flexible frontal appendages, their use alongside poorly specialized oral cones meant that food could not be easily processed and digested. This likely explains why most of the group died out following the Cambrian period, their niches being replaced by more efficient predatory invertebrates. But we do have at least some suspension feeding species that seem to have survived into the Devonian period. Cool. All right. And uh, our next story concerns a member of the robust Australopithecines, uh, Paranthropus robustus, who has historically been nicknamed the Nutcracker Man because the initial analyses of their heavy skulls, jaws, and teeth pointed to a diet of mostly hard foods like nuts and seeds. This idea has gradually been worn away through subsequent studies, which instead pointed to these hominins as grazers of grasses and other C4 plants. For one thing, a close look at the microware on the teeth did not show evidence of hard food consumption, and carbon isotope studies pointed closer to plants like grasses than anything else. The large teeth and prominent sagittal crest on the skull were there to support the sorts of strong muscles needed to process tough grasses, much like that of living gorillas. This particular study effectively added yet another nail to the coffin of the Nutcracker Man moniker. Here, the authors examined tooth chipping patterns on the teeth of Paranthropus robustus, as well as several other hominins and non-human primates, to see whether there was any evidence there regarding potential diets. Indeed, Paranthropus showed more similarities with species like chimpanzees and colobus monkeys, in that they had far less tooth chipping present than other primates that tended to eat more solid foods, like mandrills or sake monkeys. This is expected if Paranthropus robustus was mostly eating grasses and fruits, which don't leave chip marks on teeth. It seems ever more likely that this species of hominin was not a living nutcracker, and we now have multiple lines of evidence to support this. Hmm. It's always good to see uh, corroborating evidence for established ideas. And our next story kind of does something similar, um, though for a very different group of animals. Uh, these are the ever-fascinating pterosaurs, those Mesozoic flying reptiles that were probably closely related to dinosaurs but were not dinosaurs themselves. Some researchers have long suspected that juvenile pterosaurs were probably capable of flight, uh, maybe even as soon as they hatched, but a new study tests this idea in detail. So the authors looked at juvenile specimens of Pterodustro from the early Cretaceous of South America and Sinopterus from the early Cretaceous of China. And one of these juvenile Sinopterus was actually a specimen formerly considered a distinct genus, uh, Nemecolopterus. In any case, what the authors found was that the size of the wings in juvenile pterosaurs would have allowed them to glide extremely effectively, covering much longer distances than modern gliding animals such as flying squirrels can. Now, gliding animals are adapted to cover moderate distances through the air while not spending excessive resources. So, uh, if juvenile pterosaurs could glide much farther than specialized gliders, then this suggests that they were regularly traveling greater distances through the air, consistent with being capable of powered flight. The authors also found that the strength of the wing bones in juvenile pterosaurs was probably more than enough to sustain stresses necessary for launching into flight, and in fact would be hard to explain as serving any other function uh, besides flight. If pterosaurs were able to fly as juveniles, this probably implies that they were able to take care of themselves from a young age, at least when it comes to moving around and feeding. Because juvenile pterosaurs were often so much smaller than their parents, however, they may have eaten different foods and lived in different environments from the adults. And that's the idea that has been illustrated here by one of the authors of this paper, Mark Witten. 
And if you'd like to read more about the study, you can not only check out the original paper, which is open access, but also a blog post by the lead author, Darren Nash, summarizing their findings, which we will link in the description below. Oh, sounds good. So on to our next story. Uh, one of the great mysteries of paleontology are the Ediacaran biota, that strange assemblage of maybe or maybe not animals that creeped and rooted in the waters of the last few millions of years of the Precambrian. One of these organisms, the vaguely sea pen shaped Charnia masoni, is the subject of this next paper. They, and other specimens like them, have been lumped into a taxon called Rangiomorpha, because they all seem to have shared a branching architecture to their growth. However, this aspect of their biology has been incompletely known because all paleontologists have had to go on were two-dimensional casts and molds of their fossils. Working with rarely preserved three-dimensional fossils of Charnia, the authors hope to dissect their branching body plans and see how their growth actually worked, while also trying to answer questions of phylogeny as well. Charnia's body is divided into multiple branching orders, including a lengthened leaf-like first order and a smaller centralized and interconnected second order. The authors revealed compartmentalized cavities inside these branches, but were unfortunately not able to decipher any meaningful information mm -hmm. regarding what types of tissues and organs were present. In particular, uh, they could not validate or deny a previously published hypothesis that Charnia's internal cavities were gastrovascular in nature. Uh, the 3D analysis also revealed that all the branches of Charnia's frond were indeed connected together, while the branches themselves seem to have grown as distinct structures through a hierarchical morphogenesis, in which subsequent first order branches grew out of second order branches in a rapid sequence and within different phases, as is illustrated here on the left. By using the observed characters in the 3D fossils, the authors were able to plug them into a phylogeny with other living members of early diverging animal groups. Across the board, it was found that Charnia was a stem eumetazoan, belonging just outside the larger clade of animals with true tissues, neurons, and muscles, things like nadarians, and bilaterally symmetrical forms, having evolved after the split with sponges and a little-known invertebrate group called placozoans, who have been argued to share affinities with some ediacarans on occasion. Hmm. Now, the authors state that this is the first time and Ediacaran has been able to be studied alongside other animals using a, quote, credible homology-based phylogenetic analysis. And this paves the way for future studies into the lives of these strange organisms. Nice. So uh, this next paper used isotopic analyses to bring new details on the life history and reproduction of Titanosaurs, one of the last members of the sauropod lineage and including some of its largest members. Uh, see the photo of me under the Patago Titan at the Field Museum to the right. The titanosaurs are not always known from complete remains, hmm. but we've at least found many nesting colonies, like those of the sites of La Rioja province in Argentina, where the remains used in the study were excavated from late Cretaceous rocks. After checking the isotopic measurements of the titanosaur eggshells, as well as a single tooth, Alongside neighboring rock from the site, uh, determining that the isotopes reflect life histories and not preservation bias, the authors could then interpret their findings. They were able to calculate the body temperature of a laying titanosaur based on the isotopes in the eggshell, and found that these dinosaurs had quite elevated body temperatures comparable to those of living birds, you know, which has been argued heavily in the past. Uh, the analysis of the preserved titanosaur tooth um, they also found a general growth occurring within an animal that maintained a constant body temperature. So we kind of have some corroboration going on. Uh, isotopic studies on teeth are also good for understanding what types of food were being consumed. And traces were found of C3 plants, which is to be expected in a world that was not dominated by grasses and other C4 plants. At least not yet. And lastly, the authors were able to glean some idea about titanosaur nesting habits from the isotopic studies. Titanosaurs might have relied on hydrothermal activity in egg incubation, much like how some of the birds called megapodes of the western Pacific Islands bury their eggs in mounds of soil and warm their eggs through geothermal energy. Obviously, an animal as large as a titanosaur was not sitting on its nest. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it also seems that titanosaurs preferred to lay their eggs during the dry season, since it would have been far more dangerous to nest during the wetter seasons where flooding could drown the eggs. Right, that makes sense. Um, our next story is about these clusters of small animal bones from the late Cretaceous of Montana in the western United States. Several examples of these bone clusters were found, mostly consisting of bones from two types of mammals, Alphodon, which is a close relative of marsupials, and Felicomys, which is a member of an extinct group of mammals called the multi-tuberculates. And one of these clusters also had part of a lizard skull inside it. Based on evidence from the composition of the rocks that the bones were preserved in, the specific bones that were present in the clusters, and the damage to the bones themselves, which included etching that might, might have been caused by digestive acids, um, the authors of this study found it most likely that these represented pellets of indigestible material that had been regurgitated by a predator. If so, what kind of predator was it? Well, out of potential predators that have been found at this fossil site, the authors considered a troodontid dinosaur to be the most likely candidate. They actually call the troodontid from this locality troodon, uh, though that's controversial for reasons we don't need to go into here. But in any case, troodontid fossils are indeed very abundant at this site, which includes remains of not just their bones, but also nesting sites. Their anatomy also suggests that um, they were well adapted to preying on small vertebrates, and direct evidence of pellet production has been previously reported for similar dinosaurs, such as Enchiornis from the late Jurassic of China. Therefore, these findings could give us a lot of insight into troodontid biology, as well as the overall ecosystem that this fossil locality represents. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And last but not least, uh, here is our final story. This is another one that we previously talked about on the 2021 update special for Dinosaurs, the second chapter, but it's very interesting, or I think so at least, so we'll cover it again here. Modern birds are basically divided into two major lineages. One is the um, ostrich-like birds, uh, which also includes emus, kiwi, and their kin, though these are the paleonates, or the so-called old-jawed birds. And the other group is pretty much all other living birds, the neonates, or new-jawed birds. And we don't need to go into too much detail about the anatomical distinctions between these two. If you want to learn more, you can see episodes 2 and 3 of Dinosaurs, the second chapter. But uh, the basic gist is that two of the bones in the palate of paleonate birds are fused together, whereas in neonate birds, uh, these bones have a mobile joint between them. Traditionally, it has been assumed that the palate of paleonate birds was more similar to that of the last common ancestor that all birds evolved from, which is why they are called the old-jawed birds. However, a newly described skull of Ichthyornis from the late Cretaceous of Kansas in the Midwestern United States suggests that this may not be correct. Now, Ichthyornis was not a modern bird but it was one of the closest relatives to modern birds that we know of in the fossil record, and may in some ways be a good model for what the last common ancestor of all living birds looked like. So this new specimen preserves part of the palate, and as it turns out, what there is suggests that it had a neonate-like palate, where there was a mobile joint formed by two separate bones, and so it may be the neonate palate that is a more ancient condition in the lineage leading to modern birds, which would be pretty ironic. Now, a minor thing about this paper that I'll quickly mention here because people have asked me about it, uh, this study includes a phylogenetic analysis that incorporates a newly described fossil bird called Asteriornis, which lived in what is now Belgium near the very end of the Cretaceous. It is one of the oldest convincing fossils of an actual modern type bird. And I was part of the research team that described Asteriornis in 2020, and in our study, we suggested that Asteriornis was most likely closely related to the chickens and ducks and similar birds. But the analysis in this new paper finds Asteriornis as an early paleonate. And, well, what is my opinion about this? Um, the short answer is that I'm pretty skeptical. Uh, the support for this new result is not very strong, and the data set used here was focused more on teasing out the relationships among close relatives of modern birds instead of modern birds themselves. However, the new findings about Ichthyornis and what it can tell us about the evolution of the avian palate are extremely cool. Absolutely. And uh, that's really it for our stories. Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. And welcome to my section of the 2021 Paleontological Rewind. I'll be covering a selection of the paleontological discoveries made during the first half of August. 
with past eons taking care of the second half. I have highlighted six important papers to discuss that will be covered in a chronological order of publication, so without further ado, let's get started. The first paper I'd like to highlight was that published by Arthur Broom et al. on the 5th of August and describes a new genus of Unenlegi dromaeosaur from Brazil. Named Ipupiara, which means the one that lives in the water in the Tupi language, the remains of this animal were uncovered from the Maastrichtian-aged Bauru group of the Paranya Basin. The remains of this genus were actually first discovered many decades ago, in a period between 1940 and 1960, and consisted of a fragmentary right maxilla and dentary. These were initially described as belonging to an indeterminate vertebrate, and were found in association with a fish jaw. This holotype was stored in the National Museum of Brazil, and would not be discussed again for another 80 years. A paper describing this material was scheduled for publication in 2018, with the fossils being photographed in readiness for further analysis. However, a fire tragically tore through the museum on the 2nd of September that same year, destroying the holotype along with innumerable other specimens. This caused a significant delay for the paleontologists involved, with their paper only being released earlier this year. Based on the photographs taken of the specimen, Ipupiara was assigned to Unenlegionae, a peculiar lineage of dromaeosaurs that were endemic to the southern continents. In life, this theropod would have measured an estimated 2 to 3 metres long, and probably possessed an elongated narrow snout that was utilised for grabbing small mammals, amphibians, and a variety of river-dwelling fish. In terms of phylogeny, Ipupiara was placed as the sister genus to Ostroraptor, a better known and larger Maastrichtian unenlegene from Argentina. Next, we'll shift over to an animal that died out far more recently, the famous Stella's sea cow. This gentle giant, the largest Cyrenian to ever live, was native to the seas surrounding the Commander Islands, which lie in the Bering Sea between Russia and Alaska. A massive herbivore that fed solely on kelp, Stella's sea cows belonged to the genus Hydrodomalis gigas, and grew to a maximum length of 9 metres or 30 feet, and weighed in at an impressive 8 to 10 tonnes as adults. This animal was a member of the Cyrenian family Dugongidae, with its only living relative being the much smaller dugong of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. A gregarious and social species, Stella's sea cows lived in small family groups near to the surface, as their enormous bodies were naturally buoyant and were incapable of sinking. Their skin was thick and darkly coloured, protecting the species from damage caused by sharpened ice and rocks. Unfortunately, these adaptations left the sea cows both vulnerable and desirable to human hunters and whalers. First described in writing in 1741 by German zoologist Georg Steller, the genus was rapidly hunted to extinction for its meat, milk and blubber. On the 8th of August 2021, a paper by Cameron Bullen et al. examined the extinction of this impressive Cyrenian and suggested how the species helped maintain the health of its kelp forest ecosystems. The authors found that the sea cows contributed to increased nutrient cycling in life, aided in the dispersal of kelp spores through grazing, and contributed to an increased diversity of microalgae in the understory. In addition, excessive hunting of contemporary sea otters may have also led to the extinction of Hydrodomalis, with the absence of otters leaving sea urchins to run riot, destroying sections of kelp forest on which these animals relied. In all, this was an important study of the key role played by marine megafauna in maintaining their ecosystems, as well as the potential negative impacts caused by their extirpation. On the following day, August 9th, a new genus of Australian pterosaur was described in a paper by Timothy Richards, Paul Stumcat, and Stephen Salisbury. Since fossils of these flying reptiles are incredibly rare in the land down under, the naming of a new species is a significant event indeed. This animal was named Thapungaka, which means spear mouth in the Aboriginal Wanamara language, the remains of which consisted of a partial lower mandible that was unearthed from Upper Albion Age deposits of the Toolbook Formation, Queensland. Dated to approximately 104 to 100 million years ago, Thapungaka represents the largest known Australian pterosaur genus so far described, with an estimated wingspan of up to 7 metres or 23 feet. Phylogenetic analysis has placed this pterosaur as a member of the family Ahangueridae, being in particular a part of the subfamily Tropionathinae. Thapungaka was closely related to two other Australian members of this subfamily, with these being the smaller Ferradraco and Mithunga. 
In life, this genus would have been a large piscivore, soaring over open waters and seizing fish with its sharp conical teeth. In other Mesozoic-related news, the 12th of August saw the description of two new sauropod dinosaurs from the Xinjiang region of China, named Silu Titan and Hami Titan, respectively. These animals were native to the early Cretaceous Shenjiko formation, dating to approximately 120 million years ago. The former genus, Silu Titan, meaning Silk Road Giant, was described from a holotype specimen consisting of six cervical vertebrae with intact neural spines. A modestly sized sauropod, Silu Titan sinensis measured approximately 9 metres or 30 feet long, and weighed about as much as a modern Asian elephant. The phylogenetic analysis conducted in the paper placed this animal as a member of the Macronarian family Euhelopidae, a group endemic to Eastern Asia. It was found to be the sister genus of the slightly larger Euhelopus, and would have been a high browsing herbivore in life. The second genus described in the paper was Hami Titan Xinjiangensis known from seven caudal vertebrae from the lower tail. A non-lithostrian titanosaur that measured approximately 17 metres or 55 feet long and weighing in the region of 35 tonnes, Hamititan was most closely related to genera of South American origin, including Kaiju Titan and Noto Colossus. In life, both Silu Titan and Hamititan lived alongside indeterminate theropods, another unnamed sauropod, and the pterosaur Hamiterus. On the 13th of August, a paper by Christoph Hendricks and Philip Bell reanalyzing the preserved skin impressions of the Abelisaur Carnotaurus was published online. This famous carnivorous genus from the late Cretaceous of Argentina possesses the most extensive skin impressions of any theropod dinosaur, and the only example of this form of integument known outside Tetanure. The skin is preserved in the shoulder, thoracic, tail and possibly neck regions, and consists of medium to large conical feature scales, surrounded by a network of low and small non-imbricting basement scales, separated by narrow interstitial tissue. Contrary to the conclusions reached in older studies, Hendricks and Bell suggest that the larger feature scales were randomly distributed, and did not form neat rows, as seen in traditional reconstructions of this animal. They also show little difference in morphology along the body, while the basement scales vary greatly in size and shape across different regions of the animal. The authors suggest that this placement aided Carnotaurus individuals in shedding excess heat, with the skin playing a vital role in thermoregulation in the life of this large, active predator. Switching our attention away from non-avian dinosaurs and towards the animals that thrived after the KPG extinction event, we come to a paper describing three new genera of so-called condyloths from the early Paleocene of North America. Condyloths were a wastebasket group of basal ungulates that has historically included a vast array of families that may not have been closely related to each other. One early group of condyloths were the periptychids, a family of generalized herbivorous and omnivorous terrestrial animals that first appeared within hundreds of thousands of years after the end of the Cretaceous, and seemed to have been close relatives of the pantodonts. A new study published in August by Madeleine Atbury et al. named three new periptychid species, all of which were rather large by the standards of early Paleocene mammals. Bayonus honeyi, a cat-sized genus with bulbous molars, was named after the shape-shifting bear-man Bayon from The Hobbit, and likely fed mostly on plants supplemented by insects and possibly carrion. It would not have resembled modern ungulates at all, instead appearing more like a raccoon or civet with five-toed feet, a long heavy tail, and possessing a flexible diet. Two close relatives, Conacodon and Miniconus, dwelt in the same subtropical forested environments of early Paleocene southern Wyoming. These discoveries suggest that we cannot generalize about mammal diversification rates in the aftermath of the KPG extinction event, with certain groups achieving larger sizes rather rapidly, setting the stage for the later evolution of true hoofed mammals. We are living in the golden age of paleontology, with hundreds
hundreds of discoveries and tens of new species uncovered each year. And this year didn't break the straw. In this journey, we will revisit the highlights of the second half of August 2021. So fasten your seat belts, and here we go. For this first stop, we go 71 million years in the past to meet a very distinctive and iconic dinosaur, Carnotaurus, but more precisely Carnotaurus sastre. In August 2021, a paper has been published by Christoph Hendricks and Phil R. Bell concerning the Abelsaurid skin composition. In fact, there was some speculation about the possible presence of feathers on it. However, Thanks to a detailed description of the theropod's integuments, the researchers have found that the feature scales are distributed rather randomly, counter to previous interpretations, and have multiple forms. They also speculate about a thermoregulation role that the skin could have played. We are here to meet a member of a species of which has been described an exceptionally well-preserved specimen. And it isn't a dinosaur. No, it's a pterosaur, and not a big one. Tupindactylus is its name. In fact, the unveiled specimen is not only complete, but also articulated and associated with the remarkable preservation of soft tissues, which makes it the most complete tapiarid fossil thus far. It is regarded as an adult, which helps classifying it as exactly a tupa navigans due to its vertical supraprimaxillary bony process and rounded parietal crest. This crest, like for most other pterosaurs, serves as a sexual display to attract females. These individuals are enjoying the fresh water as much as they can until their next migration. They live amongst giant spinosaurids called irritators, piscivorous dinosaurs, These lands should soon find their usual greenness. By the way, this specimen has been found during the police raid after an investigation of the legal fossil trail. We can't stay here for too long, so let's now take our fly to the late Cretaceous and explore new horizons in a different environment. During this time, the oceans were populated with a high diversity of creatures, of which giant sea turtles, plesiosaurs, sharks and also mosasaurs. We are now going to take a deep dive, so be careful and stay alert. Researchers at the University of Cincinnati identified a new species of Mosasaurus. The finder, a professor and his students, have named it Mosasaurus everhartrum. The marine reptile lived in what is today western Kansas, but back then was the western interior seaway, a vast expanse of water splitting North America in half during the middle and end of the Cretaceous. The newly discovered species marks only the second species in its genus, Actinosaurus. At first, the fossilized jaw has been suspected of belonging to a platycarpus, but a mix of intuition and further research allowed the professor to find that in fact it was another species, a new one. On 
On August 23rd, a paper has been published regarding the nerve sensors of T-Rex's jaw. The study concluded that, quote unquote, the nerves in the mandible of Tyrannosaurus rex is more complexly distributed than those of any other dinosaur studied to date, and comparable to those of modern day crocodiles and tactile foraging birds, which have extremely keen senses. These nervous senses probably served to detect different organs of their prey, letting them rather delicately pick specific ones. This, however, is only speculation, and its function could have been radically different. What's certain, however, is that our perception of T-Rex has not finished to change. To end this journey, let's mention a paper published in the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences regarding an anatomical comparison made between two brain cases of Daspletosaurus. More specifically, it is a comparison of Daspletosaurus thoracus and a specimen that could have been new distinctive species. Multiple anatomical differences have been found, such as differences in the olfactory tract, but also a longer common carotid duct and multiple other very specific ones. However, not only differences have been found in this comparison. In fact, some characteristics could actually prove the unicity of the two specimens under a single species. Furthermore, we know that such changes could be attributed to a difference in age. In conclusion, more similar comparisons have to be made to comfort the idea of such an anatomical diversity within the Tyrannosauridae family. Hi, I'm Prehistorica, and today I'm participating in a massive collaborative effort to bring YouTube the ultimate Paleo Rewind for 2021. With dozens of YouTubers contributing, including Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong, Keenan Taylor, Henry the Paleo Guy, and Edge himself, each month has been split in two, and each half assigned to a different content creator. In this segment, we will be covering the first half of the month of September. Be sure to check out the other contributions from other creators, and subscribe to Edge so you don't miss it when the full compilation is uploaded at the end. Now, what am I gonna cover? There's one thing this video needs. Kicking off the month, we have a topical new discovery from the Cambrian of Utah. While the Cambrian is most famous for the fauna of the Burgess Shale, Lagerstaden from the time exist all around the world, with multiple localities specifically in the American state of Utah. The Margem Formation of Western Utah, nestled into the House Range Mountains, preserves a fauna from the Laurentian Sea near the Burgess Shale, dating back to roughly the same time. 506 million years ago, give or take a few million. The sea was relatively shallow, the fauna was composed of many animals also common to the British Shale, including an indeterminate species of Hardia, a uh, sweet feeding herded, uh, Osha disjuncta, an onteranosed acorn worm that lived in finely built collagen tubes. Earlier this year, in January, they also described a new genus of herded, Bucospinia cooperi which was previously only identified as a new species of herded with an enormous mouth. On September 6th, we got a new genus of Paleoscolecid worm, the first known from the formation, called Arachiscolexaceae, named after the armored sandworms of Frank Herbert's novel Dune, which lived on planet Arrakis, as well as after the collector who discovered the fossils of the worm, Arvid Aze. The worm, which sported an armorous sclerotome of densely packed, tiny, node-like plates, was rare, or rarely preserved. 
This is in line with several other Cambrian Lagerstaaten of the Laurentian coast, and perhaps demonstrates that different taphonomic controls affected the preservation of paleoskeletic worms during the Cambrian. Published on the same day as Arrakis Golex, I would be remiss not to mention the detailed analysis of face biting in Tyrannosaurus, a common component of intraspecific combat among some archosaurs. This study looked at 202 different Tyrannosaurid specimens, and discovered a total of 324 different facial biting lesions, wounds left behind when two Tyrannosaurs gave each other what some might consider to be the world's meanest, bloodiest kiss. They found that the scars were frequently found in the same places on the skull, suggesting that biting was almost ritualistic, like the rutting of deer, only with far more gore. The wounds are absent in the youngest specimens, and begin to show up as the Tyrannosaur entered sexual maturity, indicating that this behavior was probably practiced among similarly aged males, competing between each other for mates. Roughly 60% of adults had some kind of facial lesion. Taken together, the life of a hormonal Tyrannosaur teen was painted in blood, and many took these scars into adulthood. Among dinosaurs, this practice of violent intraspecific combat was largely phased out with the development of feathers, which could be used for displays. But among archosaurs, it still exists in crocodiles and alligators. Next on our list, we head to the Cambrian Burgess Shale, for a discovery that I, and a few other Cambrian nerds, had been patiently waiting for since early 2019. Titanocores gainsi, also known as the Mothership, is an enormous, stout-bodied herded, and a close relative of Camboraster falcatus, which was discovered around the same time. Reaching a length of roughly half a meter long, it was one of the largest animals ever discovered in the Burgess Shale, rivaling the almost equally long Anomalocaris canadensis. While neither it nor Anomalocaris canadensis were even close to the largest animals alive during the Cambrian, the mothership was still one of the Burgess Shale's largest predators. It was a sweet feeder, like Camboraster and Herdia, using their appendages like fine combs to rake soft-bodied prey like worms or molting trilobites out of the sediment before passing it to the spiny mouth on the bottom of the head. The description of Camboraster came in 2019, as its fossils easily beat out Titanocores in quantity and quality. The description of Titanocores, then, was long awaited, and helmed by the same two scientists, Joe Moisiuk and Dr. Jean-Bernard Caron from the Royal Ontario Museum. It was known as the Mothership during field excavations, just as the smaller Camboraster was called the Spaceship. Later, it was originally going to be named Megaraster, in reference to its giant head, and as a complement to Camboraster. The name was changed to Titanocores, meaning Titan's Helmet, to better reflect the material. The specific epithet, Gainsey, is in honour of Dr. Robert Gaines, who helped during field expeditions at the Canadian Fossil Site, and conducted numerous studies to better understand the environment and taphonomic conditions of the Burgess Shale. Some of the best material, including a large, well-preserved head shield, and a head shield that served as the holotype covered in agnostids feeding on the remains, are now on display at the ROM's new gallery, Dawn of Life, which opened in December. In our next piece of invertebrate news, we go back to the Cambrian of Utah, to a different site this time. The Spence Shale, discovered by Charles Walcott of Burgess Shale fame in 1908, dates back to roughly the same age as both the Burgess and Margin localities. It is home to a host of Cambrian fauna most typical, such as indeterminate herdids, a species of anomalocarid, and uniquely the only described American lobopodian, a Cynocrycus stichus, a heavily armored Collins of Vermid, Collins monster with hundreds of spines lining its body in whorls. On September 21st, a new discovery was published. A single fossil of Waptia, a small shrimp-like arthropod, 
with eggs preserved in three dimensions. The fossil was collected by the Gunther family and came from a site called Miner's Hollow. While initially unexceptional, aside from being a 506 million year old soft-bodied arthropod fossil, the specimen was recently probed with x-rays using a machine called a synchrotron. Literally, they stuck a 506 million year old bug fossil from Utah inside a giant fourth generation particle accelerator in France to look at its eggs using an x-ray 100 billion times more powerful than the ones they use in hospitals. One of the eggs actually came loose, so they glued it to the end of a toothpick, and then stuck it inside of a particle accelerator. All of this actually happened. Anyway, the results, unsurprisingly, are detailed. Of the roughly 18 eggs preserved in the cluster, which would have been tucked under the carapace in life, 11 are preserved in three dimensions, in various states of decay. The mother, an indeterminate species of Waptia, was 8 centimeters long. The eggs themselves are, on average, about a millimeter wide. Details revealed by the particle accelerator include the exact mineral composition of each part of the egg, an area possibly corresponding to the yolk, a jelly-like membrane around the egg, and a part of that membrane that likely attached to the carapace of the mother. The inside of the egg was weakly acidic, full of phosphorus and other minerals. The eggs were at different stages of development at the time of burial, leading to the different internal chemical compositions. Lastly, to end off this year's invertebrate special, we go to the Ordovician of Spain. Here we find a species of average-sized trilobite called Placaparia cambriensis. This trilobite was completely blind, and survived by bringing small suspended food particles into a feeding chamber under the head. The cephalon protected the appendages close to the head, and also helped generate a weak vortex to drag in food particles. Interestingly, a team from Bogota, Colombia and Madrid, Spain, looked into the life of Placoparia using a technique called fluid dynamic simulation. They used a model of Placoparia's exoskeleton, complemented by trace fossil evidence, to investigate exactly how Placoparia integrated with its physical environment. They found that, just like some modern marine arthropods, Placoparia engaged in a kind of hopping motion, or underwater punting as it's called. While it was unable to swim, it was able to frequently leap up into the water from a substrate by kicking off from its back legs before being dragged back down by the fluid. A hop. It probably did this to escape predators, primarily. This kind of hopping motion had previously been hypothesized for monomorphicness, a trace fossil as old as the Cambrian, suggested to have been made by an arthropod trying to stabilize itself. It also explains tiny differences in leg counts in trilobite walking traces, diplicnites, Differences in speed or water flow over the body of the trilobite affected the number of posterior legs that made contact with the substrate. At lower speeds, the back legs touched the ground, but at higher speeds, they were raised off the sediment, leading to a variety of conditions for walking traces left by even the same species of trilobite. Hey guys, welcome back to Cretaceous Cast. I hope you enjoyed the last video on September from Prehistorica, and I'm going to be doing the second part on it today. I got uh, a few topics to talk about. Some pretty cool stuff happens in, in September, so I'm excited to talk about that. And then the next video is going to be made by Benji Thomas, and he's doing one on October. So, without further ado, let's get ready. Oh boy! So the first thing we're going to be talking about is Scipionics. It was an interesting thing that happened in September. Guess what? <laughs> it's another dinosaur that's that's gone forever. Just kidding, man. Not really. Uh, you know, instead instead of going the way of the dodo bird, you know, <laughs> it should be going the way of the troodon. You know what I'm saying? Five people. Got 
So the paper on symbionics comes from a guy named Andrea Ka. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, and it covered two different kinds of theropods that come from Italy, one of which was Saltria venator zanelli and Scipionix samniticus. And the first bit of the paper goes over Saltria venator a little bit. Basically, it just talks about how it's a theropod that came from the early Jurassic. This critter comes from the Saltria formation. Gee, I wonder where it gets his name from, Saltria venator. If it wasn't for that, was it because it's a salty ceratosaurus? Just kidding. I'm sorry. That's third joke I've made today that's horrible. Uh, anyway, it was an earlier kind of ceratosaur, represented one of the... It was the beginning of the ceratosaur family, and basically the earlier part of the paper discussed how ceratosaurs started out as a tetanurin-like form. Tetanurins are basically a large group of theropods, so what it means by that is tetanurins are kind of a basic theropod. So uh, the paper went over how started out as a basic kind of theropod and how ceratosaurs eventually became what they are iconically known as, you know, with the big horn and all that. The Saltria venator was said to kind of represent a form that was more bulky and big than how ceratosaurs became later on. And uh, the paper also uh, talked about a little bit how ceratosaurs don't really have arms that are that important for hunting. And so it suggested that that happened from earlier ceratosaurs in the family, such as Saltria venator, not using their arms during hunting as much, and so over time that meant that their arms would become reduced. So the real meat and potatoes of this paper comes from Scipionix. And so what the whole thing with Scipionix in this paper was is the author was suggesting that Scipionix might not be a compsognathid, compi, it might actually be a juvenile version of a carnosaur, particularly the Carcharodontosaurus. And so the reason he suggested this is because there haven't been any, any adult versions of Scipionics found, which is a little weird, and this happens with other compies in the family too. And so what he did was, is because of this weird thing, he ended up running two phylogenetic tests, one which considered compies a family. Well, it, it didn't really put into consideration the fact that they were young. And then another test just kind of looked at them without considering them a family, and all the compies in that family ended up really far apart from each other on the phylogenetic tree. And so on this phylogenetic tree, Scipionics ended up where Carcharodontosaurs are. And the paper pointed out that some compies are actually, they're around as big as what juvenile versions of Carnosaurs like Carcharodontosaurs would be expected to look like. And uh, the paper pointed out that Scipionics, in specific, had particular traits with its face bones, particularly the maxilla and premaxilla, has uh, five teeth on the premaxilla, and that is quite a bit like how Carcharodontosaurs are. The other paper I'm going to be talking about comes from Scientific Reports, and it covers two new kinds of spinosaurs that were found, um, one of which was called Stratosucops inferodios, and the other was Rapara venator milneri. You know, Ceratosucops, it's kind of a funny name. Like, it sounds like a hybrid between Ceratosaurus, Sucomimus, and Triceratops. I wonder if Jurassic World Alive would ever, would ever tackle that. Um, but yeah, so essentially it was these two Spinosaurus lived alongside Baryonyx in the early Cretaceous. The paper goes over the problem that all these different kinds of Spinosaurus were living together at the same time by suggesting that they could have basically lived in different niches. Um, basically that, you know, they could have come out during different seasons of the year, or they could have just simply lived pretty far away from each other, so they could technically live at the same time period. So the two new Spinosaurs from this paper, the bones found from them mainly are facial bones and tail bones. And they use those bones to differentiate them from other baryon baryonchines, which are the subfamily of Spinosauridae that has the dinosaurs like Baryonyx and Pseudomimus. And basically, the way they found them to be different is um, Ceratosucops and Rapara venator are different from each other because of how their occipital condyle is put together. That's the bone at the back of the skull. Hold on one second, let me get my... So right here, I've got my Velociraptor skull. Pretty cool. And at the very back of the head, right here, little focus, that is the occipital condyle. And this is the bone that um, showed that Rapara venator and Ceratosucops are different from each other. The occipital condyle of these two dinosaurs is also a bit different from Baryonyx, so that's another way that they can be differentiated from Baryonyx. And uh, they also have holes in the skull at different spots than Baryonyx would as well. A cool finding in this paper that it goes over is that it suggests that um, Spinosaurus started out in England, 
and they ended up diverging towards Africa, um, and they found this out through paleogeographical reconstructions. Another cool thing that the paper went over is how there's been um, discourse in the paleo community about whether or not the subfamilies of Spinosaurinae and Baryonchinae can be separated from each other. And so this paper did some tests and stuff, including these new Spinosaurs, and it ended up concluding that they still do have that separation between each other. However, there are some certain factors that still need to be put into play. With these computer simulations trying to figure out what goes where in the family tree, there are some things for Spinosaurs that need to be, there need to be more of, and these are operational taxonomical units. And so currently those are kind of spotty. But so far, it does still seem like Spinosaurs uh, have Baryonchines and Spinosaurines. So yeah, that's it for me for today. I hope you enjoy. Scientific progress never stops, and paleontology is one of the prime examples of this. The new discoveries and scientific breakthroughs that occur in this field every year continue to make headlines around the world and intrigue the public, and 2021 has been no different. Since on this channel we run the weekly 7 Days of Science series, you'll probably notice that a lot of the stories here have been featured in the October episodes of the show. Still, the discoveries that were made this month are absolutely incredible and hugely exciting, so they're worth repeating. From new dinosaur species to omnivorous ground sloths and a new human species, this really was an action-packed month for paleontology. Well, we'll start off with an interesting paper that was published at the start of the month, namely the discovery of the first definite hippopotamus fossils from the early Pleistocene of Britain. Found in a cave in Somerset in England, the discovery of this fossil indicates that the site dates back to between 1.5 to 1.07 million years ago, and represents either one of two things. It could be that this hippo was part of an early colonisation of northwestern Europe by these animals, or that it indicates there was an even earlier, previously unknown northward hippo migration during a temperate phase of the Quaternary. Definitely an incredible discovery either way. Something else that occurred this month was the description of a new dinosaur, a troodontid from the Upper Cretaceous of Inner Mongolia named Papiliovenator nemenguensis. Known from an almost complete skull and parts of the body, this dinosaur was notably short-snouted for a troodontid and was found to be placed at an early diverging branch on a group including all other late Cretaceous troodontids. Papiliovenator also enabled the paleontologists to get a better understanding of troodontid anatomy in general, discovering that species of late Cretaceous-aged troodontids in the Gobi Basin had tooth and cranial anatomies that differed from each other, as well as varying forelimb lengths, taken to indicate differences in these animals' foraging behaviours as they adapted to a range of feeding methods in this restricted geographical region. But that's not the only non-avian dinosaur that was named in October. We also saw the description of Pendrig milnerae, a late Triassic-aged coelophysoid theropod from a deposit in southern Wales. The name of this dinosaur is from the Welsh for chief dragon, while the species name, Milnerae, is named for Dr Angela Milner, who co-described Baryonyx and was a key researcher of English dinosaurs who sadly passed away earlier this year. The Spinosaurid Reparovenator Milnerae was of course also named after her this year too, and it's nice to see so much recognition for all her work. Pendrike was found in a fissure-filled deposit, with the known fossils comprising an articulated pelvic girdle, a sacrum, dorsal vertebrae, and a left femur, plus two referred specimens represented by a single vertebra and a bit of a hip bone. There have been some recent suggestions that the animals found in late Triassic and early Jurassic fissure-filled deposits such as this might actually have been affected by insular dwarfism, and so the paper describing the new dinosaur actually tested this idea for Pendrike itself. Looking at body size in early neotheropods, the study found that a reduced body size is unique to Pendrig, but also that other coelophysoids did show a similar reduction, meaning that there's some slight but ambiguous evidence supporting the idea that this newly named taxon did indeed experience dwarfism. So a great new dinosaur discovery that adds to our understanding of the Triassic world and early theropod evolution. October was also the month in which a very cool paper was published describing a fossil tardigrade from the Miocene preserved trapped in amber. This paper explains how tardigrades, or water bears, have a long evolutionary history, diverging from other panarthropods sometime before the Cambrian period based on molecular clock analyses, and yet their fossil record is incredibly sparse, with only two Cretaceous fossils having been found. This amber discovery, the first tardigrade found from the Cenozoic, is described as a new genus and species. Paradoryphorebius chronocaribius. The paper also brings up the hypothesis that the rare fossil record of these animals is due to tardigrades only ever really fossilizing in amber, added to the fact that fossil amber deposits are very scarce before the Cretaceous. 
An absolutely amazing find nevertheless, and very rare. Hopefully more fossil tardigrades will be found eventually. Also in October, I got cancelled for reporting on a paper about ground sloth diets, so I'm really looking forward to talking about this again. Basically, a study was published that performed isotopic analyses of nitrogen of the specific amino acids recovered from bones of Darwin's ground sloth, Mylodon darwinii, discovering evidence to suggest that it was actually an opportunistic omnivore. The study then goes on to say that this direct evidence of omnivory in the sloth means that the ecological structure of the prehistoric South American mammalian communities needs a re-evaluation, considering the fact that sloths were a huge part of these for many millions of years. And that's all I'll say. Some interesting developments to do with elephant evolution were made this month as well, when a new genus and species of mid-Eocene aged proboscidean was described. This species, named Dagbatitherium tassii, comes from a quarry in Togo, and is actually highly significant due to the time in which it was found, since a long gap of 13 million years did exist in the African proboscidean fossil record, but this new find filled that gap. Additionally, Dagbatitherium, which is known from a lower molar, displays many characteristics of an elephantiform, with the researchers classifying this animal as a stem elephantiform and therefore pushing back the origin of this lineage 10 million years earlier than we'd previously realised, a very significant discovery indeed. October was also the month in which the earliest evidence of herding in dinosaurs was announced. The research explains how although herding in derived sauropodomorphs, the sauropods themselves, is well documented, evidence of this behaviour had not yet been found in Triassic and Early Jurassic non-sauropod sauropodomorphs. However, in this paper an Early Jurassic aged site in Patagonia was described as preserving more than 100 eggs and 80 skeletons of various growth stages of the sauropodomorph Musaurus mostly in a small area and from the same stratigraphic horizon, with groups of individuals of similar ages clustering together in some cases. The paper therefore interprets all of this as evidence of social cohesion as well as age segregation within a herd, plus colonial nesting. This is therefore now the oldest record we have of complex social behaviour in dinosaurs, extending the known range of such behaviours back by around 40 million years and indicating a Triassic origin for this sort of thing. It was an absolutely amazing discovery to read about, a very exciting development for sauropod paleontology and learning about prehistoric behaviour. We were then also treated to a really fascinating paper on the evolution of tusks. The paper explains how tusks, which are defined as continuously growing incisors or canines composed of dentine, have convergently evolved multiple times within mammals, but not in other animal groups, except for a non-mammalian synapsid clade, the dicynodonts. The paper therefore suggests that there must be some kind of feature of mammals and mammal line synapsids that makes tusk development possible, and attempts to identify what these features are. Examining the tusks of 10 different dicynodonts and comparing them with true mammals, the researchers found that the features needed for tusks to evolve include highly reduced tooth replacement as well as a permanent soft tissue attachment between the teeth and the jaws. So, since these features are found in crown group mammals, this explains why they were able to convergently evolve so many times within this animal group and their stem relatives, but not in others. It was a very interesting paper to read when it came out, and also made me realise that I'd never really thought about the definition of a tusk before. Finally, it wouldn't be a month of paleontology news without a controversial reclassification of hominin species. October was also the month in which we greeted a new species of prehistoric human, Homo boudouensis. The reasoning for this new taxon being introduced was said to be because the poorly defined species Homo heidelbergensis and Homo rhodesiensis failed to reflect the true diversity of hominins living at this time in the Middle Pleistocene. As such, in addition to the introduction of a new species, the paper explains that many of the fossils from Western Europe that are currently assigned to Homo heidelbergensis should instead be referred to Homo neanderthalensis. Homo boudouensis is therefore named not based on any newly discovered material, but as a way to try and clean up the complicated mess of hominin taxonomy, with the Bodo skull from Ethiopia being the holotype specimen, and the species having a pan-African distribution that even stretched into the Mediterranean. However, not everyone agrees with this new classification, with a prominent paleoanthropologist at the Natural History Museum in London immediately after the publication arguing that the naming of a new species was not necessary, especially as older names that already exist in the literature would take precedence over this newly created name anyway. He did state that only European specimens should probably be assigned to Homo heidelbergensis, and ones from Africa should be classified as something else though, but yes, as I said in Seven Days of Science, basically in an effort to simplify hominin evolution, this paper has just made everything more complicated for everyone. But that's just paleoanthropology, really. Well, that's certainly not everything that happened in paleontology during the month of October, but those are some of the highlights and things I thought were particularly interesting.
Uh, before we get into the more paleontological discoveries made this month, I want to first talk about a specific controversy that happened in late October of 2021 that I would otherwise not mention at all if it didn't involve our good old friend Jack Horner. Ben from Benji Thomas did a great job covering all of the things from the first half of October, but that's not where it ends for paleontology this month. The second part of October also had some notable moments in paleontology, so without further ado, let's continue Paleo Rewind with a rather different topic for this series that involves everyone's favorite paleontologist, Jack Horner. So in October of 2021, Jack Horner caught himself in some more controversy. For those of you that don't know, Jack Horner is a very prolific, no, that's not the word. What is it? It's a, a very respectable, nope, wait, hold up. That's not the word either. Um, Man, I, I don't know. What is it? Jesus, it's at, the, it's at the tip of my tongue. Infamous, that's the word I'm looking for. He's a very infamous paleontologist in the community. All jokes aside, Horner is no stranger to controversy as he's had some pretty rough takes on dinosaurs in the past. But this recent controversy doesn't have much to do with the dinosaurs themselves, but rather his latest project that he decided to use them for. This project was an attempt to sell a collection of paleo art to people, but not like the cool hand-drawn stuff you'd see in books, no. Jack Horner decided to instead create dinosaur NFTs that he would then sell for a bunch of money, because that's a thing right now. That's right, for those of you who didn't know, Jack Horner, you know, the guy who was brought on as a consultant for the first Jurassic Park movie, is trying his hand with NFTs now. And I think that's pretty funny. Now when he announced this to his Twitter on October 16th of this year, you could probably guess what the reactions were. People were not too happy about this because for those of you that don't know, NFTs are a very debated topic right now. Because I don't want this whole segment to be solely based on what NFTs are, I'm going to give a brief definition of it and why people don't like it. NFT stands for non-fungible tokens, which are interchangeable units of data on a blockchain, which makes it so it can be sold traded and owned on digital markets using cryptocurrency. NFTs are known to sell for ridiculous amounts of money because these works of digital arts, GIFs, and even videos can sell for literally thousands and sometimes even millions of dollars. So why are people mad about this besides the absurd prices? Well, the blockchain that's typically used for NFTs is Ethereum and they use a lot of energy to run their network. So much so that they use just as much, if not more energy just to run these networks as a small country uses within a yearly period. And as you probably already guessed, that increases greenhouse gases, making it very bad for the environment. And again, a paleontologist, a man who studies extinct animals is participating in a trend that is bad for the environment. Environment. Kind of ironic, which I think is what makes it funny, but I do have to say, some of his artwork isn't that bad in terms of looks. I still wouldn't buy them because, I mean, look at those prices. Horner had apparently collaborated with paleo artist Fabio Pastori, which if you don't know him, you'll surely know his works, as he has a very distinct art style, especially when it comes to his works in prehistoric life. While I can't say I 100% agree with how he's distributing this art, I can't say it's bad by any means. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's definitely quality work, just not thousands of dollars and leaving me broke in the streets quality work. And that's the other thing about NFTs that a lot of people seem to have an issue with, and that's the fact that you don't even truly own it. Because the buyer doesn't receive any real copyright privileges and the original creator can still distribute it and make more work like it. From what I can gather, people who buy this stuff don't buy the actual product, but rather they buy the proof that they purchased the product. Or as some would simply call a receipt. You are essentially buying buying a receipt that says you paid for something. Man, I bet you didn't think you'd be learning about NFTs and why people hate them in a Paleo Rewind video, but here we are. Anyways, Jack Horner has a whole collection of these NFTs that he titled Jack Horner's Dinosaurs, The Origin Collection. In this collection, he portrays the dinosaurs with very unique coloring, different behavioral elements, and has even made animations for some of them. There are several dinosaurs within this collection, including Myasaura, Pachycephalosaurus, Troodon, and T-Rex Cavenger. The most notable one is definitely this T-Rex, which has been fitted with a chicken-like comb for some reason. Honestly, still looks pretty cool in my opinion. All right, that's enough of that. I know this isn't what you normally see here on Paleo Rewind, but it's always nice to catch up on our good old friend Jack Horner and see what he's been up to lately. But I know what you guys are here for. You're here for the actual paleontology stuff, you know, the discoveries and news on dinosaur fossils and whatnot. So let's get into that.
Along with the Jack Horner controversy, another very notable event happened during this time that involved a rather pressing matter in the world of paleontology. And it's one that I've talked about before on my own channel, and that is the idea of auctioning off dinosaur fossils. On October 21st of this year, a Triceratops skeleton that's known as Big John would sell for around $7.7 .7 million in an auction in Paris. For those of you that don't know, Big John is a fossilized Triceratops skeleton that was discovered in 2014 by paleontologist Walt Walter W. Stein from the Hell Creek Formation, and he was named after the owner of the land in which he was discovered in. What makes him a notable specimen is his overall size. The skeleton is 9 feet tall and 26 feet long, which makes him anywhere from between 5 to 10% bigger than any other Triceratops specimen that has ever been discovered, setting the record for being the largest known Triceratops skeleton. However, this isn't the only record he set, as he's also said to be the most expensive Triceratops as well, as he was eventually sold to an anonymous US collector in late October, who purchased him for a total of 6.6 million euros, which converts to 7.7 .7 million dollars. This obviously brings up a pretty concerning dilemma for paleontologists, as some have stated that along with these specimens already being taken away from the hands of those who've dedicated their lives to studying and preserving these discoveries, the purchase of something like this at the price it managed to exceed would only continue to expand the market and demand for dinosaur fossils. This in turn could lead to people looting dig sites of specimens that could be useful for the world of paleontology that will unfortunately go through a process that will make it so they just end up in the possession of someone with a lot of money. What's worse is that this high demand will only increase the dinosaur fossil's value and make them even more expensive, making it much harder for museums to get their hands on it. And in turn, researchers and scientists won't be able to properly study or preserve the fossil, and these kinds of situations are unfortunately common. In a paper written by paleontologist Dr. Roy Smith, he talks about how baby pterosaurs from much larger species actually outcompeted the adults from smaller species. Large pterosaurs were very common in the late Cretaceous period, and those that were classified as larger pterosaurs had a wingspan ranging from 2 meters to over 6 meters in length. Small to medium pterosaurs were known to reach less than 1 meter to 2 meter wingspans, and the much smaller pterosaurs reached to less than 1 meter wingspans. Initially, it was thought that newly evolved birds were overtaking the smaller pterosaurs in the skies, but newer studies show that it was actually the babies of larger pterosaurs that were doing that. The examples that were studied were the small pterosaurs from the mid-Cretaceous Chemchem group of Morocco, where a total of over 400 pterosaur specimens have been discovered in that area. Examining the jaws of some of the specimens, both large and small, said a lot about both the pterosaurs themselves and their feeding ecology. Further research of the fossils within this group showed scientists that the feeding ecology of large pterosaurs were more similar to that of crocodiles rather than actual birds. In a modern riverbank environment like the Nile, you'd be able to spot several species of birds within the area, all different shapes and sizes hunting for prey that's only slightly different from each other. But then you take something like crocodiles and it's a completely different story. They're less diverse and what they feed on is dependent on their stage of life. Young crocodiles are known to feed on smaller, easier prey such as insects, but as they get older they will move on to smaller mammals and fish. And finally, when they're full grown, they will eventually take down a full on zebra. And it's thought that pterosaurs feeding ecology functioned the same way where in each stage of their life, they'd focus on a different form of prey that they were capable of taking down and eating. Once they reached the final boss of that stage, they would be able to continue on the game of life and eat different forms of prey until they eventually reached a high enough level to attempt the next boss fight. Don't be like that guy. Anyways, thank you all for watching my segment here on Paleo Rewind, but now it's time to move on to November, which is covered by Dane Pavitt. Welcome to the early November edition of Paleo Rewind 2021. We start by winding the clock back to the Ordovician extinction event around 445 million years ago. 
This was the first of the so-called Big Five extinction events, and it resulted in 85% of all life on Earth being wiped out. At the start of November, an international team of scientists published their investigation into the causes of this ecological disaster. Through geochemical testing and computer modelling, the study examined the environmental conditions before, during and after the extinction. Their findings suggested that deep ocean environments saw a decline in oxygen saturation, while shallow water environments like reefs and coastlines remained well oxygenated. One explanation could be a global decline in temperature, disrupting ocean currents and preventing oxygen from being circulated into deep water. The ocean is a deeply interconnected environment, so when one area suffers, it often has a knock-on effect elsewhere. It's still not 100% clear what caused this global cooling event, but this discovery is an important piece of the puzzle and opens up a new chapter in figuring out this ancient mystery. Moving up the timeline to the late Triassic of 220 million years ago, we have the announcement of a new plateosaurid dinosaur from the frozen cliffs of Greenland. Plateosaurs were an early branch of the sauropod line of the dinosaur family tree, which would later go on to produce giants such as Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus, and Dreadnoughtus. This new dinosaur was actually first uncovered in 1991, with many other fossils being found in the years that followed. They were believed to belong to a species of Plateosaurus, a dinosaur known from European fossil sites. But this year, two near-complete skulls underwent rigorous scanning and assessment, and a paper published by Victor Beccari as a master's thesis, no less, announced that this was an entirely new creature, E.C. Sarnak. This is the most northern discovery of a Triassic sauropodomorph to date, and is also the first instance of an entirely unique dinosaur genus being found in Greenland. On top of this, EC appears to show anatomical similarities to plateosaur fossils found in South America. This has greatly expanded the known range of this family, and opens new avenues of investigation into their evolution and distribution. A little closer to home now, a discovery from the Isle of Wight off the South British coast. A former GP turned paleontologist, Jeremy Lockwood, had spent years cataloguing fossils from the island. When the world got shut down during the year of which we do not speak, he spent his newly acquired downtime piecing together a dinosaur specimen that had been locked away in storage since 1978. Long believed to be an Iguanodon or Mantellosaurus, it turned out this fossil had expanded nasal bones, which those other dinosaurs don't possess. Wouldn't you know it, it was a new species, Brystonius simmonsi. Considering how many fossils of this type tend to get lumped into either Iguanodon or Mantellosaurus, Brystonius's distinctive snout has implied a far greater diversity in European ornithopods than previously believed, as well as some very unflattering headlines. Hopefully this reclassification means more specimens in deep storage can get the attention they deserve so their full story can be told. And finally, we come to the Ice Age, with the ongoing debate on the extinction of the woolly mammoth. Whether it was climate change or human hunting has been a hot-button issue for a good long while, and a research team led by scientists from Denmark and Australia hopes to shed some light on it. By using fossils and DNA samples, the project assessed mammoth distribution and genetic diversity to understand where, when, and how their populations declined. Widespread climate change caused the mammoth's ideal habitat of dry, open tundra to shrink, and this certainly caused a great reduction in their numbers, but maybe not enough to have totally totally wipe them out. The results of this study suggest that hunting by humans for meat, fur and ivory could have accelerated their decline by as much as 4,000 years. This in combination with rapid climate change would have been too much for the mammoth population to compete with and they eventually became extinct around 4,000 years ago. This whole study asks us to reject the idea that human hunting was a kind of finishing blow to an already dwindling species, something which I've been guilty of myself. Instead, consider that independent of one another, hunting or climate change might not have taken them down, but that they were both integral factors in the mammoth's extinction. The destructive human activity on a large scale, combined with massive changes in global climate, are just too much for natural selection to keep up with. But maybe there's a little something to learn from this. Thank you for your time, I hope you've all had fun and learned something, and please enjoy the rest of Paleo Rewind 2021. Fossils of a coelacanth hailing from Cretaceous, Texas were discovered. Now, for those who are a bit out of the loop, you might remember coelacanths best as living fossils. As the tale goes, coelacanths are an ancient type of fish who evolved 400 million years ago that were long thought to have died out 66 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous period, but were rediscovered floating around the ocean minding their business, oblivious to the fact that we all thought they had been taken out along with the dinosaurs. Of course, living fossil is a bit of a misnomer. These creatures do evolve over millions of years, pretty significantly in fact, although it might just not be superficial. For instance, I wouldn't judge you for confusing a modern coelacanth with the newly discovered prehistoric coelacanth who swam the Mesozoic oceans millions of years prior. The new species is a member of the genus Mawsonia, and it was a big one, reaching approximately 1.5 meters in length. 
although other species of Mausomia could reach a terrifying 5 meters. This new species is also special because it is a rare example of a Mausonia genus from North America. Most are from Gondwanan waters, Gondwana being the southern continent in Mesozoic times. This coelacanth is also the youngest coelacanth fossil from Texas, coming in at a ripe 98 million years old. Look at this pinecone in amber. Not only was this pinecone lucky enough to get trapped in amber for eternity, but it is the first example of a special behavior never before seen in fossilized plants. You see, most seeds won't germinate or grow until they fall off of their parent plant, or leave the parent fruit. But sometimes the seeds just can't wait, and begin the germination process while still on their parent plant. This process is called precocious germination, also known as vivipary and usually occurs in various types of fruit. But it is incredibly rare in pine cones. In fact, pine cone precocious germination has only been officially described once by science, according to Professor Poinar, who described the piece of amber. So the fact that this pine cone seed started sprouting and was trapped in amber for 40 million years to be the first fossil plant to show vivipary is truly an incredible stroke of luck. I know what question has been plaguing your mind as of recent. What really is the transition from snake to lizard? When is something just a normal snake or a really long lizard? After all, this is a lizard, so is this. Where does the transition begin? This query about the origins of snakes and when they break off from lizards has stumped scientists for many years. Then came Tetrapodophis amplectus, a small aquatic reptile from 110 million year old Brazilian rocks. After the discovery of Tetrapodophis in 2015, the paleontological world thought they might be getting somewhere, as the animal appeared to be a primitive snake that still had vestigial limbs, and the creature was dubbed the first snake. Yet a new study disproves this supposed missing link between snakes and lizards. Although the animal does possess the characteristic long, spaghetti body of serpents, other anatomical traits reveals Tetrapodophis was instead a type of marine lizard known as a delicosaur unrelated to snake ancestors. The main factor that changed these scientists' minds was the features of the skull, and after further examination of it and the mold around the skull, revealed it shared no similarities with snake heads. So with the lead of the tiny tetrapod office being thrown away, the mystery of the first snake remains even more difficult than it once was. This little dinosaur, Berthosaura leopoldinae, was found in Brazil. Hailing from the early Cretaceous, Berthosaura is a dog-sized, agile herbivore or omnivore descended from what else but giant, ferocious predators. The new species is a member of the enigmatic Noasaurid group, who are part of the larger theropod group Ceratosauria, who already contain the other interesting group known as Abelosaurs, who I've already gone over before. Noasaurids are some of the least well-known of any dinosaur group, made up of a vast array of small, agile animals whose most unifying trait seems to be the fact that they were trying to be the exact opposite direction that the rest of the ceratosaurs were going. The fact some are nimble, lanky-armed omnivores really seems to fly in the face of the burly and comically small-armed traditions of their cousins. Berthosaur takes this even further by being toothless, and instead possessing a beak. The other cool thing about Berthosaur is the fact it's one of the most complete noasaurid skeletons to date and could help us in further understanding these weird dinosaurs. Missouri is not the first place you think of when fossils pop into your mind. Missouri probably isn't the first place for basically anything else that pops into your head, except for maybe giant metal arches. But recently, several exciting dinosaur fossils have been excited 110 miles south of St. Louis. Digging up the specimens started in 2017 after a juvenile dinosaur was found 10 years ago. Now, multiple individuals of the same dinosaur species, Hypsobema missouriensis, have been dug up by a team led by University of Minnesota paleontologist Peter Makovicki. Makovicki said the animals probably were buried together because of some sort of mass death of a dinosaur herd, such as in a flood. The species Hypsobema, sometimes incorrectly referred to as Parasaurus, is a hadrosaur, known widely in popular culture as duck-billed dinosaurs and could grow 10 meters in length and floated around 3 metric tons in weight. Dinosaur bones really are rare for Missouri, so this fruitful dig has been big news over there. Also the fact the animals died while in a group 
may reveal more things about herding behavior in dinosaurs. Moving on to another reptile of deceptive origins, we have new research on Ephigia. What type of dinosaur was Ephigia exactly? Well, the correct answer would be none of the above. Ephigia is a type of reptile that I like to call the almost dinosaurs. Creatures who are closely related or look very similar to dinosaurs, but are technically not. For instance, Ephigia is most closely related to crocodilians than it is to any dinosaurs. Ephigia and the rest of the almost dinosaurs also lived in the Triassic period, as the first actual dinosaurs started popping up and would eventually outcompete all of the copycats. Ephigia is also weird because although descended from crocodilians, it was an agile herbivore. The new research shows these animals had a weak bite force and shearing jaws, which would have made it most suitable for browsing on soft plant material. As weird as it sounds, they were actually many other herbivorous crocodilians during the Triassic. But most Triassic herbivores either dug up tough roots or fed on the tall trees. Ephigia's in-betweener status further illuminates the diversity of Triassic life. Ichthyosaurs, the adorable dolphin lizards of the Mesozoic Oceans. Pretty much the most family-friendly prehistoric animal behind Barney the Dinosaur. But as always, prehistory is more sinister than Land Before Time will have you believe. Cahitasuca is a new species of large ichthyosaur from the early Cretaceous, described from a 1 meter long skull. What separates it apart from other ichthyosaurs is the size and spacing of the teeth, which would have made it a ruthless predator of large prey, such as other marine reptiles. The name in fact means, quote, the one that cuts with something sharp, in an indigenous language in central Colombia where the fossil was found. Cahitasuca is a mighty predator, but also represented one of the last of the ichthyosaurs. The animal lived 130 million years ago in the early Cretaceous, where a shift was occurring in the Mesozoic waters, and the old ichthyosaurs were soon being replaced by new types of marine fauna. Ichthyosaurs wouldn't survive much longer into the Cretaceous, but at least they went out large and ferocious. Stop the hammering! A long, long time ago, a wise man once said, The Elasmotherium did have a horn, Adding on to its appearance was a truly massive horn, which might have grown as large as a man. Well, turns out he was completely wrong, along with many other people. The Ice Age rhino relative Elasmotherium, nicknamed the Siberian Unicorn, has usually been depicted with a striking giant horn on top of its head. But recent studies suggest this horn was not really a horn as much as it was a stump. After analyzing the skull of Elasmotherium, scientists came to the conclusion that a thin shell of horn-like substance covered the large dome over the animal's nose. The dome itself was made of bone, and allowed for extra space in the nasal cavity to increase sense of smell or possibly function as a resonating chamber to enhance noises Elasmotherium made. I know this small curved horn covering doesn't really compare to the massive stalagmite that used to jut out of its head, but I still find it pretty neat. The study also suggests Elasmotherium possessed a hard growth on its muzzle that alongside strong lips and neck muscles allowed the beast to dig up the underground parts of plants. This would give Elasmotherium a unique ecological niche not seen in the large herbivores of today. So sure it's lost its horn, but if this new study isn't disproven, it will make Elasmotherium a very distinctive animal, much different than even the rhinoceroses it is distantly related and usually compared to. So those are the major paleontological events of late November. An amount of these articles aren't new discoveries as much as they are correcting our old view of extinct animals. Paleontology is a scientific field that is prone to a lot of change. It's one of the things that makes writing a YouTube video trying to tell correct information on it difficult. You never know for how long you'll be correct. But that's also the beauty of the field. It's still growing, day by day. Just look at how much was discovered in a period of about two weeks. I'm glad that this science is always being updated and our knowledge is pushed further every year, and I'm glad I got to be a part of reporting that to you this year. Well, it seems you've reached the end of your trip. Welcome to the final part of Paleo Rewind 2021, a series of videos put together by Edge and other content creators covering some of the year's biggest discoveries in the world of paleontology. This year, I have the pleasure of presenting to you some of the findings from December 1st all the way up to today. I I'm really hoping they don't find definitive proof hexapodal dragons once roamed the earth within the hour of this video's publication. 
if you haven't already, be sure to check the previous episodes in this series, including November's creators, The Budget Museum and Dane Pavitt. A link to their videos in the description. Additionally, a full video with everybody's contributions will be released on Edge's channel tomorrow, January 1st. If this date is in the past for you, you can find a link to that video in the description as well. If this date is in the distant future, please contact your local doctor and scientist to discuss how you may be suffering from a time travel experiment gone wrong. And without further ado, let's begin! Thyrophora are a group of Ornithischian dinosaurs that lived during the early Jurassic period until the end of the Cretaceous, featuring dinosaurs such as the Stegosaurus and Ankylosaurus. The newest member of this family is Stegosaurus elegasin. This dinosaur's near-complete skeleton was found in subantarctic Chile, and just like other armored dinosaurs, it had a tail weapon. While the Stegosaurus has a pair of spikes and the Ankylosaurus has a tail club, Elengasin had a flat, frond-like structure with seven pairs of laterally projecting osteoderms encasing the bottom half of the tail. The animal itself was relatively small, only being about 2 meters in length, and had a body like a Stegosaurus. Its skull, on the other hand, closely resembled the armor appearance of an Ankylosaur. So, which is it? A Stegosaur or an Ankylosaur? The answer? Neither. After extensive research into similar species, it was found Ellen Gasson was closest related to the Kunbarasaurus from Australia and the Antarctopelta from... Well, use your imagination. Yep, that's right. It was found in... Cleveland. What the f going on, Carter? Only in Cleveland, South. Just kidding, it was actually Antarctica. In fact, after Ellen Gasson's discovery, the three were moved into a new clade altogether, known as Parankylosauria, which are characterized by their small size and stegosaur body and ankylosaur head combination. While we can't be 100% sure its tail was used as a weapon, well, let's just say you don't want to be on the receiving end from a hit from it. Open the door, get on the floor, our next story has us walking with the dinosaurs. Pop culture often depicts dinosaurs like the T-Rex running after people, only for them to catch up and make a tasty primate snack out of them. What they didn't tell you is this was not scientifically accurate. Shocker, I know. In reality, it's believed T-Rexes could not even actually run, and clocked in at a max speed of 12 miles per hour. In fact, most dinosaurs did not run at all, or at least preferred not to if given the choice. While 12 miles per hour is certainly fast enough to get most people, if you're Usain Bolt, the fastest man in the world with a top speed of 27 miles per hour, you shouldn't have any fears of one of these ancient creatures catching up to you. Until now. La Rioja, Spain is famous for its dinosaur footprints, many of which have been found here in the past. The location's most recent discoveries from sites La Torre 6A and La Torre 6B, however, set a new record in the world of paleontology. On December 13th, two sets of tracks, 6A14 and 6B1 were discovered, being comprised of 5 and 4 footprints respectively. Even though we don't have any remains of what actually left these prints, we can still learn about a lot from their creators by observing the prints themselves. We'll go into appearance in a bit, but let's focus on the locomotion of the creature first. There are two important things to focus on when considering how the creature moved. First is the length of the footprint, as this can be used to calculate the animal's hip height, which in turn can provide insight into how much force the creature was using to move in the first place, and second is the space between the footprints, as this determines the stride of the animal. Iconologists were able to determine the dinosaur's prints were cast at angles suggesting the dinosaur was full on running. Quite the rarity in the world of paleontology, as it is believed dinosaurs often preferred not to run, if they could at all. Of all the recorded footprints at the site, 96% come from walking dinosaurs, a little under 4% come from jogging dinosaurs, and only these two sets come from running dinosaurs. What are they running for? Did someone set off dino mite? <laughs> little baby scared about a little bit of extinction? Anyways, how fast were these dinosaurs? Well, it's estimated 6B1 ran anywhere from 14.5 miles per hour to 23.04 miles per hour, and 6A14's printed at 19.68 to 27.738 miles per hour. To put that speed into perspective, on the low end, this puts it within the top three, and on the high end, makes it the top dinosaur speed of all time uncontested, making it the fastest non-avian dinosaur of all time. So, speed's great and all, but what kind of dinosaur is it? Well, for the sake of time and simplicity, let's assume a single species made both sets of footprints. The print reveals that the host was a tridactyl, was functionally mesozonic, 
meaning the animal's weight is supported by the middle digit, had a wider foot versus a longer one, and had present feathers. This combination of traits suggests that the maker was certainly a non-avian theropod. So looking at what theropod fossils we have found in Spain, the top candidates are Valley Bonaventrix cani from the Spinosaur genet, Concavenator corcovantis from the Cartartinosaurids, and Camariosaurus serguidae from the Ceratosaurian theropods. While it's impossible to know for certain which of these species created these prints, you wouldn't want to look back anyways if you were running for your life. Before we begin this segment, do me a favor real quick and think of a bird. What features of said bird do you think about initially? Maybe the feather colors? Maybe it has an interesting beak shape? Perhaps the song it produces? No matter what it may be, for 97.8% of you, I doubt you consider the tongue. Rightfully so. For most species, the tongue has rarely anything notable about it. In fact, I'm sure some of you didn't even know birds had tongues. This is far from the case for Brevirus duravis macrohyodus. I'm sure that's how you pronounce it. Recently discovered in the Geofiting Formation in the Liaoning Province, China, an avian fossil belonging to the Cretaceous period depicts a small bird within the Enantiothornis clade. The fossil itself is incredibly preserved, depicting two features of focus, an elongated hyoid bone and stunted cranial rostrum, otherwise known as a short beak. The hyoid bone is a small U-shaped bone that sits just above where the Adam's apple would be located. For humans, this bone's appearance is relatively insignificant. However, for certain birds, it will literally wrap around the skull, almost cupping it like a loving mother's embrace. Macrohyoid... Okay, okay, okay. From now on, I'm going to give some of these harder to pronounce names a little bit of a nickname to give myself an easier time. So for the time being, this one's name I'm going to call Jean. Jean shares this elongated hyoid shape, suggesting this is the earliest recorded case of a bird being able to stick its tongue out of its mouth. Uh, now I do realize that was a hell of a claim to make just because it has a funny bone. So what evidence do I have to support this claim? Well, first of all, because I said so. And second, because as I mentioned, some birds today share this feature. Those being the woodpeckers, the honey creepers, and the hummingbirds. And just look at these freaks of nature. What's even freakier is how this bone ties into their abnormally long tongues. The tongue needs to be stored somewhere, and that somewhere happens to be the inside of the bone. That's right, our winged friends pull the tongue back into their mouth, it wraps around the skull, and sits just below a pocket where the right nostril would be. Considering Jean has a similar bone, we can assume their tongue was similar as well. Now, what purpose could this tongue actually serve? A pretty useful one, actually. Just as modern birds do, I likely use the tongue for feeding purposes, either using it to hunt insects, drink nectar from a flower, a combination of both, or something entirely different, we can almost be certain that it evolved this trait for the feeding benefits it provided. This suggests the bird may have been a branch between early stem birds and the extant birds with this feature of today. Dinosaurs weren't the only paleo discoveries made this month. 326 million years ago during the Carboniferous period, an extraordinarily large millipede, known as Arthropleura, roamed the forests of Howick Bay in Northumberland, England. I will elect to nickname this specimen as Arthur. Found within a cracked cliffside, the fossil was originally discovered back in January of 2018. The true magnitude of this fossil wasn't realized until just a few days ago, however. Several body segments of the animal were well preserved and able to be studied, but were missing a full image of the creature, including the head. Despite this, one segment is all we need to get a rough estimate of its total size. Using the beautiful and trusty principles of worm math, we have observed that nearly every species of myriapod are 4.78 times longer than they are wide. Arthur's segments were approximately 1.8 feet wide, so using this formula, we estimate the total length of the animal was a whopping 8.6 feet, making it the largest known land invertebrate ever discovered. This species has held the title for over a decade now, thanks to a pair of fossils discovered in Germany, though these crawlers only came in at just over 5 feet in length. Of the three, Arthur is clearly the largest by a massive margin, and is believed to be an example of gigantism in the species, making Arthur the uncontested largest individual of the category. Arthur Pleura was believed to inhabit wooded coastlines, so they likely ate vegetation or smaller invertebrae, which is all of them. So, all in all, it seems Arthur is really the largest of all millipedes. Or is he? Based on the proportion of the body that was fossilized, we can only see 20 legs present. 
Now, of course it has more than 20 legs, but using more worm math, scientists estimate Arthur only had 32 to 64 legs total. The suffix milli suggests 1,000, so to be a true millipede, we're missing over 90% of the required leggage. In fact, no myriapod, extant or extinct, or otherwise, has ever had anywhere close to a thousand legs, meaning, in a literal sense, the millipede does not exist, never has been, and never will. Merry f Christmas. At least, that was the case until earlier this month. Welcome to a bonus story. Around the same time Arthur's story was published, 1,000 miles away in Western Australia, 200 feet underground, the discovery of the first ever true millipede was made. Eumilipes Persephone is a living species of myriapod that is represented by four individuals, all discovered at the same time. One of these individuals had 13,006 legs, beating out the previous record holder, Elacme planipis, by nearly 500. While I'd love to continue discussing this animal, this is Paleo Rewind, so let's get back to dinosaurs. While it is widely believed that many modern-day birds' ancestral roots lies with the dinosaurs, who are the ancestors of the dinosaurs? For the Velociraptor, the answer is... More dinosaurs! Meet Vectiraptor greeni, an ancient species of dromaeosaur from over 125 million years ago. I will refer to this individual as... Vector. Vector was originally discovered in 2004, but most of its remains were left undiscovered, and to this day, Vector is still only represented by a few spinal vertebrae and part of its sacrum. It remained in paleontologist Mick Green's private collection until recently, when a joint study by the universities of Bath and Portsmouth revealed that they belonged to a completely new species. They compared the vertebrae to other dromaeosaurs and revealed many similarities, allowing them to group the new animal within the family. Vector is much larger and stronger than the Velociraptor, believed to be about 10 feet long. It was covered in feathers, had massive talons on its feet, and had serrated teeth. Using this weapon combo, it likely hunted prey using an ambush strategy, possibly by climbing trees and pouncing like leopards, which it needed to rely on considering how slow it was. It wasn't a top predator in the ecosystem, but it was fully capable of taking down prey of similar, and even slightly larger sizes. While on the topic of its ecosystem, Vector was found in the Wessex Formation and the Isle of Wight, New England. This is extremely important, because even though a large range of dinosaur fossils have been found in the Isle of Wight, never have we found a dromaeosaur before. Previously, these dinos were exclusive to other parts of the world, such as North America and Mongolia, so finding not only a dromaeosaur, but an ancient dromaeosaur suggests the family may have originated from this area. The study then claims they were able to cross over into other continents while they were all closer together via land bridges and oceanic dispersals. This would fit as the Isle of Wight is believed to be a crossroads between Asia and America for other species of dinosaurs during the Cretaceous, so this idea is far from far-fetched. No matter the case, we welcome Vector to the family nonetheless. Imagine, you're a late Cretaceous baby dinosaur a day away from meeting the planet we call Earth. You've spent a long couple of weeks developing within your egg. Certainly a harrowing process. You've managed to get lucky enough to not be eaten by a predator. Then the worst catastrophe of the area wipes out your entire species in an instant. But, millions of years later, you get a second chance at life. As a clickbait article title on the internet, this is the case for baby Yingliang, an oviraptor embryo in ovo discovered in the Heiko Formation in southern China. Yingliang was found in a nest alongside their unborn siblings and parents but this little one appears to be in the best condition overall. There's been a lot of information about this little guy on the internet, so let me clear up something first. When paleontologists say Yingliang appears as if it died yesterday, this does not mean DNA is still intact. So no, I'm sorry. We're not on the cusp of Jurassic Park yet. However, Yingliang still does offer some exciting insight. Laid nearly 70 million years ago, the embryon is in extremely well condition, showcasing a complete skeleton of the animal. It lies within an elongate tulithid egg, and appears to be 11 inches long. We can see its head lies between its legs in the tucking position, which is a posture previously unrecognized in non-avian dinosaurs. This is a position that's common in late-stage modern bird embryos. This suggests that pre-hatched non-avian theropods had similar hatching behaviors to modern birds. Some birds are born with an egg tooth on their beak, which they can use to crack out of their shell. 
The tucking position adds further mobility to allow this cracking behavior to be executed easier for the bird. The tucking process takes a few days to occur, and based on Ying Liang's positioning, they were equivalent to a bird's position on day 17 of its 21 day cycle, which is where the headline comes from. All known oviraptor species had a beak, so considering the tucking behavior, it's likely this animal did this for the exact same reason birds do, possibly being the link for this position altogether. And finally, we come to the last story. Cetaceans, the largest animal of the oceans. Being comprised of whales, dolphins, and other similar mammals, they've ruled the seas for all of human history. These animals weren't always at the top, however. Before them, similar reptilian animals, such as ichthyosaurs, filled their fundamental niche as the ocean's top predator. Even though they were some of the top predators, ichthyosaurs only averaged about 5 to 15 feet, depending on the species, so the beasts never grew to the absolute gigantic proportions seen by modern-day whales. That is, until a few days before Christmas. Recovered from the Fossil Hill member location in the Augusta Mountains of Nevada, a gigantic ichthyosaur was unearthed for the first time. This monster was named Symbospondylus youngorum, after Tom and Bonda Young, who created an ichthyosaurus-branded beer. As such, I will be nicknaming this specimen, Tom. Initially, we only found some of Tom's vertebrae, but further excavating unearthed the animal's massive two-meter-long skull. Even more digging found more backbone vertebrae, shoulder bones, and forefin bones, estimating the creature's full size to be about 17 meters, or 56 feet for my American viewers. Tom is believed to be nearly 242 million years old, and may have been the apex predator of its environment during the Triassic epoch. Aside from being the largest animal ever discovered from this period, its large eyes were likely used to see prey at deep depths, and its large, conical teeth were likely used to hunt fish and squids. A few fun facts about the ichthyosaurs in general, they're not actually dinosaurs, they're classified as marine reptiles, which is the same case for other animals such as the plesiosaur and mosasaurus. You may have noticed, aside from size, how many similarities Tom shares to whales and dolphins. Since both don't have gills, they must return to the surface to breathe, which is where they both originated from. For cetaceans, their ancestor was the Pachycetus, a quadruped ungulate that looked a lot like a crocodile otter abomination. And as for ichthyosaurs, while we don't have the exact link, marine reptiles also evolved from a land-dwelling counterpart. It is important to emphasize that these similarities arise independent from one another, however. They don't share an ancestor or anything, so scientists have used Tom's gigantification from earlier ichthyosaurs to explore the evolution of whales and their growth towards their massive size as well. Tom's growth came relatively early on in their evolution, appearing just 2.5 million years after the first ichthyosaur showed up. Whales, on the other hand, took much longer to reach their size. Two things are believed to contribute to this rapid growth. One is the Permian-Triassic extinction, where 70% of vertebrae went extinct. This opened the seas to a large amount of prey, with few predators, which led directly to the second contribution. Ammonite squids and similar creatures survived the extinction, which happens to be the perfect prey for the ichthyosaur's serrated teeth. Now if we compare these principles to the whale story, yeah, they fit. Whales emerged shortly after the Cretaceous Tertiary extinction, and looking at sperm whales, the closest living animal to Tom in terms of size, also happened to have teeth similar to Tom which happens to also be perfect for their prey, which also happens to be squids. As such, scientists believe predators with the perfect biological weapon to hunt whatever just survived a mass extinction is what leads to this gigantification phenomenon. And that's a wrap on Paleo Rewind 2021. I hope you enjoyed! If you'd like to see the rest of the episodes, check out each creator in the description below. And if you enjoyed my lovely personality and narration, consider subscribing! If the interest is there, I'll certainly cover more Paleo videos in the future. Remember to check the completed Paleo Rewind on Edge's channel tomorrow, and continue to explore the Biodiverse.